Hey guys, and welcome back to our lecture series. I am Ted, and I'm here to give you another lecture. Now, this lecture is going to pertain to life on the Great Plains. Uh, now, before we begin our lecture proper, I would like to do a customary recap and just touch on what happened, uh, what we discussed really in our last lecture. So, in our last lecture, we were wrapping up our discussion on the Great Plains and the wars on the Great Plains. We discussed the events such as the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn, which proved to be the final uh, major uh, or large-scale battle between Native Americans and the United States Army. Uh, this was a battle, of course, that was won by the Native Americans, but it was a very hollow victory for them. Uh, they were unable to sustain that force that had, that had uh, defeated George Custer at Bighorn, at Little Bighorn, and subsequently had to break back up into smaller bands. Uh, now, the United States government, uh, after the news of Little Bighorn, decided to really revamp um, and really just sort of uh, send even greater additional forces out into the area to defeat uh, <clears throat> the natives, to sort of end the uh, what they saw as an insurgency of Native Americans in the West. Uh, Big Little Bighorn would prove to be the, uh, the final... Uh, large-scale engagement it would really just sort of be like the end of uh of native resistance um before that we touched on uh, events such as the sand creek massacre uh in which the local settlers in the denver area uh defeated uh will really just massacre the followers of the cheyenne chief black cattle uh they did this in an effort to to one, eliminate the uh, the threat of competition with the natives and the and the uh, the threat that the natives may attack them, they uh, they did that, uh, and uh, for for those reasons. But they also did it so that they can gain access to the land. They can gain un uh, disrupted or unperturbed, unimpeded access to the land resources. <coughs> and it is to the land and the land resources that we turn to now. Um, with the defeat of the uh, native, with the military defeat of the natives, settling uh, a settlement on the uh, on the Great Plains now uh, was was now allowed to uh, continue unimpeded, um, and the railways, the railways made farming and settlement on the plains possible, uh, and really without the railways, it just would have been too great of a distance uh, for settlers and and the supplies needed for the settlers to get there. The area lacked wood which is vital for fuel and for building uh, structures. Trains made it possible to ship lumber from Michigan and Wisconsin, North Carolina, Tennessee, to ship wood and lumber from those areas uh, where the lumber industry was really booming um, and to ship the grain that the farmers grew back to those locations. Without woodlands, um, <clears throat> without woodlands, uh, and and of course with woodlands it would um it would sort of be necessitated by the fact that you had to cut down the trees without those uh without having to cut down the trees and pulling out the stumps the area uh, the, that the farmers were coming to those plains those immense flatlands uh, they were able to come in uh, fairly quickly and uh, and farm on the plain the the, the the area seemed to be almost preconditioned for farming. Um, with inventions like the John Deere plow, the uh, dense prairie sod was allowed to be broken up more easily. Uh, you have to remember that the uh, the previous inhabitants of the land, the Plains Indians, were hunters and gatherers. They were not farmers. Uh, the first settlers coming into uh, coming onto the Great Prairies were the first people to farm this land. Um, for generations, really for millennia, for thousands of years, millions of years, really, um, nobody had farmed this land. It was this was a uh, virgin soil, so to speak. Uh, that this tough sod had never been broken up. It had never been disturbed. It was simply hard and compact. Uh, you really couldn't do it by the normal uh, farming or plowing measures. You needed. Uh, those mechanized, uh, those mechanized machinery, that John Deere plow, was really needed to break up that dense prairie sod. Um, the Homestead Act of 1862 encouraged farmers to acquire large amounts of land, 
Uh, and they did so at really no cost. All you had to do was make improvements on the land. You could claim up to 160 acres and all you had to do was make improvements to the land within five years, which they almost all had to do. You had to put up a house uh, and normally fence around your territory and of course plant your crops. And that got you your land. Um, there were uh, the, uh, those who went had to weather hardships but these hardships were related mainly to loneliness, uh, the very lonely existence out there. Sometimes it would just be a family by themselves. Um, insects were another, uh, and climate. Climate was another challenge. But those who went and were able to weather uh, such hardships, they were able to obtain a better life, a, a, a marked better life uh, than the one they had, um, than the one they had enjoyed uh, or been subject to before. Now the best of these farmers, were able to grow massive yearly crops driving down food prices in the United States and eliminated the fear of famine domestically for the United States once and for all. In the early 19th century, the area had been referred to as the Great American Desert. Uh, not like a desert like the Arabian Desert, but just deserted of settlers. Uh, natives had lived there, but the, the natives were not considered. And as I stated earlier, the Homestead Act granted 160 acres to any family that occupied the land and made improvements on it for five years. And the improvements could be as simple as constructing your house, putting up a fence, or planting your crops. Many families began as subsistence farmers, but uh, soon switched very quickly to commercial farming once they were able to. Um, the typical cycle of exchange was the farmer sending a big crop of grain back east and importing vital necessities like wood, coal, and other frontier needs. So it was not surprising that the towns of the western plains developed along the rail lines. Places like, uh, in places like Kansas and Nebraska and Minnesota, um, this period saw great improvements in the heavy machinery used to farm on such an industrial scale. As I stated earlier, uh, these guys were the uh, these the farmers, the farming families were the first people to farm the Great Plain. They were the first to break up that tough prairie sod. Um, so they needed these uh, these industrial plows, and the John Deere plow cut through the prairies with ease. Uh, the prairies uh, they they lacked the tree stumps, uh, which meant that it was far easier to create a farm than it had been uh, east of the Mississippi River. Now, east of the Mississippi, new farmers had to uh, cut down trees on their properties and plant around the stumps. That was um, that, that was what they had to do for generations. They had to wait until the stump deteriorated enough to the point that they could be pulled out the ground with a team of oxen. oxen. Now, the plains, because there were no trees, uh, the farmers were able to plant right away. Um, uh, they, they were able to uh, more quickly um, create the type of farm uh, landscapes that were that were used to seeing. Uh, prior to this, in the East, um, farm landscape would be punctuated by uh, rows of crops, uh, um, and then uh, and then at certain uh, junctions, certain, certain uh, junctions uh, where the crops were growing, you would see. Uh, the stump or the decaying stump of a tree and crops simply planted around there, or around the uh, the tree stumps. Now the McCormick Mechanical Reaper aided for, uh, prairie farmers um, because the, the reaper allowed them to harvest their crops more efficiently. Uh, it did the work of dozens of men and it did it almost instantly. Even with the techn uh, technological improvements, harvest time was still a time when many additional field hands were needed. From uh, the late 1880s down to the 1950s, there was a roving seasonal workforce of harvesters. Now, in the West, there was also uh, competition uh, early and disagreements early on between farmers and cowboys. Um, who were led to uh, who were led to the burgeoning rail centers in Kansas, up uh, from Texas. Now Joseph McCoy uh, recognized early that the burgeoning industrialized workforce uh, in the eastern uh, in the eastern portion of the of the United States, uh, east of the Mississippi River, he realized very early on that those people needed access to good, cheap food. 
he saw the possibility and the benefit of using Texas cattle uh, to feed these families to uh, provide the beef um, for, for those families. Now, his plan called for the herds to be walked up from Kansas to Texas, loaded onto rail cars, and transported to Chicago. Uh, they will be slaughtered at the rail yards in Chicago and have the meat uh, then shipped from the yards back to markets across the east. Um, now, the cowboys. Cowboys have the reputation of being gun-toting wild men, but the reality was far different. The cowboy's way of life was very difficult, to say the least. Uh, it was a very painstaking process to move the herds from Kansas to, uh, from, uh, to Kansas from Texas. Firstly, the cattle had to be rounded up. Uh, that that is, they had to be um, taken out, uh, taken um, from the open range uh, on the uh, on the Texas ranches, and uh, each owner would then have to brand his cattle and the calves from that year. Uh, when the herdsmen, uh, they, then the herdsmen had to lead the cattle northwards. Now this was very dangerous and had to be done very cautiously. Great care was taken not to frighten the herd so the animals didn't stampede. Now stampedes were very dangerous affairs. The animals could be injured or killed or the cowboys could be injured or killed or the animal would escape and have to be rounded up. It was a very dangerous, it was a very complicated affair. Uh, the real fear with the stampede, though, was that during a stampede, the cattle would lose weight. They would be frightened. They would lose weight. Uh, and the animals, the animals were uh, the livestock. They, they were sold by the pound. So every precaution was taken to ensure that the cattle stayed as heavy as possible. Now, cowboys uh, would have to find suitable areas for the herds to rest at night with suitable sources of water. Uh, they would often sing to the animals to calm their nerves. And this singing, uh, the fact uh, that the songs that the cowboys sang to, uh, to the cows to calm them, to soothe their nerves, to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, create this sort of uh, nice and uh, atmosphere, uh, is reflective and, and it's really the origin of the melancholy songs that um, cowboy singers uh, tended to make after uh, World, War, World War II, after 1945. Um, that that sort of melancholy type song that the cowboy sings, um, that that is, that is uh, really kind of um, uh, really prominent in country western songs, it uh, it developed it developed during this period that um, and it was it's really kind of interesting when you really think about it. Now when the trial uh, now when the trail ended and the cowboys were paid, they were able to clean themselves up and have a drink and do all the naughty things that you sort of that we sort of associate with cowboys now. Um, now the image of the cowboy had this hard drinking, gun toting, lawless character began when journalists who only saw their behavior after the job was done, observed them celebra uh, celebrating the end of a uh, successful trail. Now, the stereotype of the cowboy was established in the novel The Virginian by Owen Wister in 1902. The Virginian himself, uh, the, the, char the uh, titular Virginian from the novel, is a half-wild man with good intentions, who acts as the vigilante, but he does all his cowboy duties well. And he even falls in love with the local school teacher, the, the school marm, who herself is from back east and came to Wyoming to serve as a civilizing agent. And she does. She civilizes the local school children, ensuring that the next generation of uh, Wyoming settlers, Wyoming citizens, will be civilized. But she also civilizes the, uh, the particular Virginian um, and uh, helps to sort of calm him down. Uh, it was a wildly successful book, and uh, had, had you, uh, if you were paying attention to what I said, you would have picked up on all of the uh, the popular tropes of uh, these spaghetti westerns that will come about in the uh, the later 1950s and 60s. All of the uh, the sort of troop of um, of uh, American entertainment uh, in the 20th century are really exposed, uh, are really uh, presented there. Um, good guy, love interest. Uh, the good guy can take the the law into his hand, but he's a uh, but he's our he's our good guy. He's our he's openly our hero. Now, uh, barbed wire. Barbed wire is also central in the development of farming. Uh, 
in the west barbed wire was useful because it it uh it was light enough to be easily transported but it was tough enough to stop horses and the cat and, and cattle now wire fences wire fences can be trampled down by the animal but not barbed wire once the animal feels the pinch of the barbs they back away um, you could fence uh, an entire homestead community using little to no wood. This meant that you could separate the animals from the crops to prevent the animal from trampling the crops. Uh, this also allowed for selective breeding on farms. You could segregate the animals uh, and, uh, and let nature take its course with no worrying about intermingling. Um, now, fencing did conflict with open ranges, as more ranchers found it more profitable to fence in their properties. Now, settling the Great Plains involved a lot of changes, but land hunger, particularly among immigrants from Europe, prompted many to take the risk and settle in the West. Um, in some cases, entire communities moved intact to settle the Western Plains. We have evidence that entire Norwegian coastal communities, and in fact, entire Norwegian uh, coastal communities did move intact to the Great Plain. They, they moved into Minnesota. Um, it, it sort of uh, sort of underscores why um, the national football team had called the Minnesota Vikings. So many Norwegians, so many Scandinavians went there that they, uh, that they sort of influenced the culture there. Uh, much can be said about uh, the city of Boston and the Irish. Uh, the Boston uh, Celtics, the Celts, these Celtic Irishmen uh, moved into uh, Boston and sort of um, flavored the city. Um, John uh, Kennedy and his family are, are good examples of that. Uh, but in the uh, but on the plains, uh, entire Norwegian communities moved intact to Minnesota uh, because there was no wood on the plains. Some newcomers built their house out of that tough prairie sod. Now this was a testament to how tough that prairie sod was. Uh, the sod was so tough that you could cut uh, you could cut it out like bricks. You could cut out brick like shape shapes from the ground and build a sturdy, very sturdy home out of it. Um, and and then these uh, these uh, sod houses were great for regulating temperature. Uh, they were cool during the summer months and once you got the oven going, uh, they were well, well heated in the winter. Um, nearly all of the houses had doors and windows that were ordered from the Sears Roebuck catalog. And indeed, the Sears Roebuck catalog was originally created to be marketed to Plains farmers. Uh, another source, uh, another choice for, uh, for homes on the Plains was to simply uh, were, were, were simply dugouts. Now, dugouts were essentially caves dug into the sides of uh, of of, um, of, uh, of hills, um, and indeed, many people simply, you know, they uh, they didn't build the sod houses; they simply dug into uh, the caves. Um, and again, windows and uh, windows and doors were made from uh, what were purchased by the Sears. Uh, by the Sears catalog, um, you simply uh, built, um, dug into uh, the cave, put your doors and your windows in, and you know simply dug out the rest of it for for living quarters. Uh, those of you familiar with um, the Game of Thrones novels, um, the Westerlands. In the Westerlands, this is how they lived. Uh, nobody builds a castle; they they simply dug into the rocks, dug into uh, the mountains and the hills and so forth, and made their homes that way. Um, living in these sort of barrels. Now, uh, as stated earlier, uh, wood. Wood was um, the fuel of choice, but on the plains, um, but on the plains, uh, there, there was no wood. Um, there, there were no trees. Uh, and this, this sort of underscores why the plains were avoided for uh, so long. There was no uh, fuel. There was nothing to fuel them, nothing to build with. But the plains was home to a different and more abundant source of fuel, uh, buffalo chips, um, typically known as cow chips. But these are buffalo chips. Uh, they, were, they were called cow chips because they uh, they they function pretty much the, the same as cow chips did. Um, millions of buffaloes had roamed uh, the prairies for countless generations, and the prairies were literally littered with their dried manure. Uh, 
Now, the dried manure of the buffaloes were a good but not a very ideal source of fuel. Uh, the, the chips would momentarily flare up, but then smolder. Uh, it was not um, as preferred as wood, but it was capable of keep, uh, keeping the homes on the prairies heated. Now, several factors were at work against the success of the settlers, namely the presence of grasshoppers. And it was a very interesting case, uh, a very interesting event, I should say, in 1874, where a terrible infestation of, uh, of uh, grasshoppers took place. And it, it led to uh, crop fields just being ruined in Minnesota. The epidemic was so bad that many farmers went, uh, went bankrupt, many, many farms failed. Uh, prairie fires were another hazard to the farmers. Um, these fires will sometimes occur naturally, and they obviously pose a great risk to, uh, to the farms and to the success of the homesteaders. Rainfall was another factor uh, against the success of the, uh, the prairies. In the late 1860s uh, and 1870s, the rainfall was increasing. Now, many settlers uh, came to the belief that they were the cause of this increased rainfall. They were overly optimistic. In the 1880s, there were a there was a number uh, there were a number of dry years. That is, there were years where uh, rain fell in such insignificant amount that the farmers were not able to grow any crops. Um, they had their farmsteads collapse into nothingness. Um, now, as stated earlier, the prices of food was falling, um, and that, that was because there was this enormous surplus being grown on the prairies. Um, this was good for customers, very good for consumers, but bad for brokers, bad for farmers. Many farmers simply grew more food to make up for their losses uh, and acquired other farmsteads from farmers who had failed. Uh, and and the new plan, and uh, the new plan was to simply gain more revenue. Failed uh, because they were still increasing the amount of food available on the market. Um, these farmers uh, simply bought out their their uh, their former neighbors who had failed, and simply grew twice the amount that they had grown uh, previously using both of the farmlands, and that still undercut. Um, that, 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 that still undercut the, uh, their, their intention because they were still putting the exact same amount, uh, that same super highflated amount onto the market. Um, and, and this was the great bane, uh, and this was to be, it still is, the great bane of farming in the United States. That is overproduction. Uh, west of the 100th meridian, the entire prospect of farming was imperiled because it was just too dry. Uh, as I stated earlier, the uh, the lands given to uh, Native Americans were often dry, uh, and all, and the land given to Native Americans were often west of the hundred meridian. It would only be with the the rise of irrigation that farming would even be possible way out there. Now, now farmsteaders, uh, farmsteaders who went broke, uh, who lost their farms, um, they the banks. Uh, that they have borrowed from normally took possession of the land. Uh, the banks in turn then sold this land to speculators who were able to gain, gain large holdings. Now the purpose of the Homestead Act had been the establishment of a community or, or a very large western community of yeoman farmers. Uh, but in the far west the land obtained by uh, the, the land was obtained by a small amount of operators. Now in 1878, a book was produced, uh, the report on the arid region, which suggested a new approach was needed to, uh, to make the lands in the Great Plains and, the, and the, the Great Western Basin more commercially viable and to attract settlers there. Uh, well, Congress, Congress was very reluctant to replace the old approach, but eventually came around once the reality set in. In 1902, Congress passed the New Lands Act, in which the federal government accepted the burning of building dams and implemented the irrigation networks that would uh, that would make settlement possible. Now, uh, that would make settlement possible in these areas. Now, since 1902, the overwhelming majority of the farmland in the West have been done on irrigated farmlands. So when you uh, when you see the farmlands of states like Arizona, 
Nevada, Utah, um, and, and even and even uh, drifting further uh, to the east, um, uh, to the northeast of these areas, like in places such as Western Kansas and Nebraska, Wyoming, and so forth. These farmlands, these lands were were only made possible. Uh, farming uh, and ranching were only made possible on these lands because of irrigation, the irrigation networks. And these irrigation networks are still in existence. Uh, and there you guys have it. That is our lecture on uh, farming on the Great Plains. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit like, subscribe, and comment, and let me know what you thought about this. Uh, it's always interesting to me when we talk about the, uh, the Great Plains. So as always, uh, I'm Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture.